thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, really excited to uh, really discuss uh, this research with you guys. I think uh, we can have a really fun uh, discussion. Um, and it's great to be here in person. It's the first talk I've given in person in, in a long time. OK, so I'm going to be talking today a lot about uh, models for tissue semantics. So what do I mean by this? Um, there are three questions that arise when you look at tissues um, in whichever modality, but particularly uh, Im imaging data. So the first question is, what are the basic structures of our tissues? Now, of course, we can uh, zoom into our tissues and okay. of course, we can zoom into our tissues and uh, you know, see single cells and, and their patterns of expression. Um, but there are other structures uh, visible at other granularities and in other modalities, such as those highlighted in these boxes. And now, these structures that we see in tissues don't exist in isolation. Um, they're actually assembled into these complex tissues that we see. So one question is, you know, how are they assembled into these more complex structures? And, and these complex tissues, these structures that we see, uh, haven't just arisen by random, but have actually evolved to be the way that they are. So the third question is, uh, what are their collective meanings? So I define a model for tissue semantics to be a collection of answers to these three questions. So both you know, conceptual answers, biological answers, as well as algorithmic answers, because we're going to be working with data at the end of the day. And so once we have one of these models, each such model provides a lens for representing and understanding high parameter imaging data. And I'm hoping that by the end of the talk, I can convince you that having different models for tissue semantics, even for the same tissues, uh, can provide valuable insights into, in, into tissue biology. OK, and so why might we expect there to be different uh, models for tissue semantics? Where, where, might, where might we look to, to come up with them? So uh, here are three analogies. Um, so should we think about uh, the, tissue, uh, the structures of a tissue by analogy with genetic parts, which can be, for example, promoters, coding sequences, uh, promoters, coding sequences, and genes, which can be assembled into uh, coding sequences and terminators, which can be assembled into uh, genes, and different uh, uh, related assemblies of genes have, uh, when in cells, give rise to different phenotypes. Or should we think about the uh, structures of a tissue by analogy with mechanical parts, which when assembled together in different ways uh, give rise to machines and different related uh, assemblies of these parts uh, yield machines with slightly different functionality. Or should we think about the uh, structures of a tissue by analogy with words in a language, which when assembled together form sentences and different uh, related sentences have different related meanings. So really, the objective for, of this research is uh, by constructing models for tissue semantics. So that's answering these three questions from a conceptual algorithmic perspective uh, and using them as lenses to describe high parameter tissue images. Uh, we'll talk uh, about uh, the colorectal cancer immune tumor microenvironment, as well as lymphoid tissues. We want to be able to gain some understanding of tissues, both uh, the specific biology of individual tissues as well as kind of maybe more general principles of, of tissue organization that, that are more widely uh, applicable. Okay, so this talk is structured in, in four parts, um, and each of them is uh, informed by a different analogy and talks about uh, different data sets, um, and I'll introduce them as we go along. So the first is cellular neighborhoods, second is tissue schematics, third is called biological syntax, and the fourth uh, part is referred to as the emergent functionality, and we have these four different analogies uh, that kind of inform each of these, uh, in each of these parts. Okay, so part one uh, is about cellular neighborhoods. So uh, when you first look at these tissues, so, th these, these, uh, so today I'll be talking mostly about multiplexed uh, proteomic imaging, but the same would be uh, hold about spatial transcriptomic data. Um, when you first look at these tissues, uh, even with just uh, four different parameters, so the four different protein parameters, um, what you see is that there are uh, different types of region uh, within them, so the red part and the blue part, uh, very simple. Um, and 
that's just by looking at them eye by eye. So one natural kind of starting point for trying to investigate tissues is the question, you know, could there be regions that only become visible in uh, high parameter data that are responsible, for example, driving disease? Um, and so uh, a first approach that we took towards this was using weekly supervised learning. Um, and this was a very simple setup. We had uh, healthy, and healthy and disease uh, mouse spleens imaged with high parameter uh, codex imaging. So that was you know, 30 different antibody parameters. Uh, we extracted image patches. And instead of just using a, a standard uh, image classifier, we used a, a fully convolutional network with a global max pooling operation to, to obtain uh, the disease versus healthy classification, uh, which, which means that uh, an intermediate output is, of course, uh, uh, these images where you have different parts of the uh, tissue uh, labeled for whether, to the extent to which they correspond to the healthy and diseased states. Um, and when we apply this algorithm and you train it and then you apply it to spleens that you haven't seen before, what you see is that uh, whilst in a, in a, a healthy spleen, uh, there all of it's blue, which indicates that nothing looks like the disease state in the disease spleens. Uh, while there are parts of it that are red, many parts of it are also blue, indicating that a large swaths of the tissue look like healthy tissue. And of course, you can go in and investigate what these regions are. So on the x-axis here, we have the uh, enrichment uh, in disease spleens. So from, you know, from the disease, from the healthy to the disease. And then on the y-axis, we have the enrichment of, and of uh, within these uh, regions. And each point corresponds to a cell type. And what you see is that on, while there are some cell types that are enriched in the disease state, as well as in the disease regions, there are other cell types which are uh, depleted overall uh, uh, from the disease state, from the healthy state to the disease state, but actually enriched in the disease-specific regions. And so the, really the takeaway of this is that there are different types of region uh, in, in a tissue that are visible only in high parameter data um, and that could have different uh, functional roles. Uh, so for example, healthy versus disease. And so looking at this uh, kind of data where we had an image um, and then we applied uh, some uh, you know, uh, algorithm to uh, detect local features and divide it into uh, you know, parts corresponding to disease and parts corresponding to healthy. Um, this really reminded us of, of our high school geography lessons uh, where, we take, where we would have these models for urban structure where you'd start off with a city uh, and you divide it into different regions like the financial district uh, and this is London where I'm from. Uh, uh, the financial district, the industrial area, the, uh, you know, the suburbs, the uh, parkland, and so on. And, and crucially, these, uh, these regions, uh, these neighborhoods in a city aren't just places, but actually they have some kind of collective uh, functionality uh, in generating the, the overall output of, the, of a city. Um, and so our model was for looking at a tissue and really informed by this, this, uh, this analogy was like a city, a tissue would have multiple types of region, each of which would have a different uh, function uh, in the collective tissue output. And just like how in a city you can identify these different uh, neighborhoods based on uh, local features, like you can identify the business district by the uh, presence of shops, or the re uh, residential area by the presence of houses, uh, you'd be able to identify similar types of region in tissues by, by local features. Okay, and so our biological model to make it a bit more specific is that we'd have uh, tissues that would be comprised of different types of region. So here we have blue, green, red, and lilac, and within each uh, type of region, uh, there'd be different local processes ongoing. So for example, uh, we might, I see in lilac region, there's uh, dividing cells, or in the green region, there's uh, cells secreting certain molecules, uh, and uh, in, in the blue region, there'd be cells uh, interacting. Uh, dis distinct processes within different regions. And just like, uh, and in high parameter imaging data, it's very standard to uh, identify single cells and their cell types, we reason that the local features that we could use to identify these different regions is, uh, uh, is, is the uh, local composition of cell types. 
So we reason that we define these uh, objects uh, called cellular neighborhoods, uh, which uh, are regions with a characteristic local composition of, of cell types. Um, and to, to see if this, this uh, model for what's going on in a tissue is actually useful, we wanted to use the simplest possible algorithm to identify these, these neighborhoods. Uh, and, and this is, I think, is an interesting uh, point to think about how uh, the trade-offs in our algorithmic choices. But so what we did was we extracted uh, windows around each cell, uh, sliding windows, so extracted uh, these windows. Uh, we clustered them based on the composition with respect to cell types. Uh, and then, of course, we assigned each cell to a, a neighborhood, a CN, uh, by the window that it was found in. And this is kind of the, the, uh, the simplest possible thing that you could do. But this algorithm is, is just a way to identify regions. What we're interested in is this model for tissue semantics, this, this urban model, which is how can we show that these neighborhoods, uh, these regions are neighborhoods, uh, that is that they have kind of roles in the collective output of a tissue. And so for that, we turn to this uh, data set of the colorectal cancer immune tumor microenvironment. And I'm gonna just uh, introduce this data set because I'm gonna talk about it in a few different, uh, in a few different uh, sections. So in this data set, the, the main thing to know is that there are two kinds of, two patient groups, one of which is called CLR. It's characterized by the presence of these uh, tertiary lymphoid structures. And so this is a tumor, this is the, uh, this is the, the tissue, this is the invasive front. Uh, and the CLR patients uh, are characterized by the presence of these uh, TLS, which I've in, indicated with these blue dots. Um, and the DII patients uh, uh, don't have these TLSs. Uh, the CLR patients have uh, much better survival and the DII patients have much worse survival. Um, and the patient groups here were matched for all other characteristics. Uh, there were four uh, regions for each patient that were extracted, um, made into tissue microarrays and, and uh, codex imaging was performed to, uh, to this is 57 antibody parameters were, uh, were it, these tissues were imaged with 57 antibody parameters um, and uh, cells were segmented and, and the major immune subsets uh, uh, and the functional states and structural features were, were identified. Okay, so we ran our algorithm to identify CNs um, and what we end up with something, with something like this is we have the CNs that were identified uh, and the cell types that were used to define, to identify those CNs. Uh, and what that enables, having such a simple algorithm for identifying uh, neighborhoods, is that it enables us to actually name what's, what these regions are and interpret what they are. So that's what we did. We, we named them, we said, okay, this one is enriched for T cells, so let's call this T cell enriched. This one's enriched for granular sites, let's call this granular site enriched and so on. Um, and so we had this, this naming, and once we've interpreted what these CNs are, uh, we were able to say, okay, we're claiming that these CNs are these regions defined by these cell types. Let's actually look on the tissue uh, in both h &E and in the multiplex imaging data, and we can actually validate uh, that these, not just that these regions exist, but that these regions correspond to what we're naming them to be. Whereas, you know, we, there might be more sophisticated algorithms to identify regions, for example, using uh, neural networks or a weakly supervised approach like we uh, talked about before, but that wouldn't have enabled us to actually name uh, what those regions were. Um, and so after we na named and, validate and kind of validated these neighborhoods, uh, what these regions were there, what we did was we compared uh, across the two patient groups and saw that apart from uh, neighborhood five, which was the follicle uh, or the TLS, the, the blue dots in the previous image, uh, the schematic that I showed you, all the other neighborhoods were uh, conserved across patient groups. Uh, and so that's a real that was a real opportunity to, to address this question uh, of whether these, uh, you know, these regions are, are playing a role in collective tissue output, because if there's a difference in the behaviors of these neighborhoods, uh, we could, be, between these two patient groups, we could infer that these uh, CNs are playing a role in, in collective tissue output. 
And so the conceptual and kind of algorithmic challenge at this, this stage was, you know, we've just defined these objects, these regions, these neighborhoods. We want to define and infer their behaviors in a way that's kind of biologically meaningful as well as kind of algorithmically feasible. And so to do this, we, we took inspiration from, uh, uh, you know, uh, cell types. So the, we first started by defining uh, the functional states of, of CNs. Uh, so, you know, just as how a, uh, the functional state of a cell type is typically defined, is can typically be inferred by the expression of certain functional markers, uh, we define the functional state of a CN by the frequency of functional cell types within that CN. Uh, and what we found actually that is that uh, the functional state of, a, of the granulocyte enriched uh, CN, which was measured by the frequency of these uh, PD-1 positive CD4 T cells uh, was actually uh, associated with survival in DIA patients. Uh, so that, that, what was that saying is that the functional state of, of that granulocyte enriched CN is associated with survival. What's important though is that the overall frequency of these cells uh, across the tissue was not associated with survival. Okay, so we have the functional states associated with survival, but the, the cell type frequency is not. And this isn't a complex machine learning model, uh, you know, for pred predicting survival that would require uh, high, uh, high parameter imaging data to validate. It, it's something that we could clinically assess with just a few different antibodies. And what that means is that functional states of CNs are a useful notion of CN behavior for the ITME uh, and might be worth thinking about in, in more experimental contexts. Okay. Just as how in, an, in a city, if what was happening in one neighborhood were correlated with what was happening in another neighborhood, you would uh, infer that there's some communication that were uh, mediating that cor correlation. Uh, we define the, the communication between CNs as correlations between their functional states. Uh, and what we found is that the uh, functional state, uh, the, uh, the frequency of uh, Treg, so a suppressive cell type, in one CN was negatively correlated uh, with the uh, frequency of uh, CD8 T cells in a different CN, but only in this, uh, the group of patients that, that didn't do well. Uh, which means that alterations in CN communication are implicated in better uh, anti-tumoral immune responses, because you have these different differences in correlations between the functional states, differences in communication. Okay, and uh, I won't talk too much about this, uh, but we wanted to use the fact that uh, in, a, in a tissue we expect there to be combinations of, of neighborhoods, like in, a like in a city, across different cities you see, you know, common themes like the industrial area, you always have an industrial area and a residential area because people need to work, people need to, people need to live. We reason that there'd be these tissue modules uh, across, the, across the tissues and that we'd be able to see them not just at the level of, of our neighborhoods, but also at the level of single cells. And so we used uh, uh, tensor techniques to be able to find, identify these modules expressed in, in terms of both of these views of, of the data. Uh, we also extended the uh, uh, notion of communication between just looking at uh, one, uh, the frequency of one cell type to looking at the frequency of multiple cell types using canonical correlation analysis just to, to relate what's going on with, in one neighborhood with another. And by looking at multiple neighborhoods, uh, we were able to build an inter CN uh, communication network. And all of this analysis is uh, published in this paper from 2020. Okay. So the story so far is that we, we use this urban analogy of what's going on in the tissue, and we gained a clinically relevant understanding by, by uh, using this model for tissue semantics, this urban model for tissue semantics. Um, and so that uh, really raised the question is, okay, maybe there's other models for tissue semantics that could be useful. And so we thought, can CNs be viewed as building blocks to construct schematics of a tissue type? Um, and so that's kind of this analogy where you have different parts and schemat uh, schematic uh, that shows you how to build, build structures. Um, 
And if we, why do we want to do this? Because instead of uh, just viewing it as a, a city which just is, we thought that having a schematic would enable kind of reverse engineering tissues and isolating their design principles. Okay, so the starting point for this analysis was uh, the notion, was the idea that it doesn't really make sense to uh, draw boundaries around uh, different neighborhoods in, in a tissue. Uh, we actually reasoned that, instead reasoned that, when these different uh, neighborhoods are in contact is when we'd see interesting biological, biological interactions occur. So you have local processes in each one, and that might give rise to some kind of interesting interaction. So instead of just uh, trying to draw boundaries, we actually want to map where these possible boundary regions are and, and, and see what kinds of interactions might occur within them. Uh, and so uh, so we, this is the notion of a spatial context, and a spatial context is just uh, regions where these interactions could occur, and uh, we map that we define them as regions where there were CNs in contact. And so uh, how does this work? Well, this is our toy tissue where we have different neighborhoods. Uh, we just extract the pairs. Uh, so here we have blue and green in contact, so we represent that by blue and green. Here we have blue, green, and purple in contact, so we represent that by blue, green, and purple. Here we have blue and purple in contact. Uh, and we have, here we just, we, just have, we just have the green, just have the blue, just have the purple, and so on. Um, and these regions have occupied different sizes, uh, so we indicate those with the circles, and, and we connect them by edges to indicate the relationships. And we refer to this as a CN combination map, just because there's uh, you know, combinations of neighborhoods. And, okay, so, what are the, so that's you know, where, the, where there could be possible interactions, so how might we infer what these interactions might be? Well, so if we saw something like this, so imagine these are our cells, and we saw that, uh, and the white and the red here indicate uh, the expression of certain phenotypic markers. If we saw something like this, we'd infer that, oh, there's some kind of enrichment of a, a specific phenotype in a specific spatial context. Uh, so that's some kind of interaction that we might infer. And so we just mapped, you know, the increasing in expression in, in these different areas. Um, and of course, we can use permutations to generate uh, null distributions and, and uh, you know, quantify the, statistically uh, the, the extent to which we see this enrichment. Uh, uh, these are static, since we're, all, we're working with static images, we can't really resolve whether the uh, changes in cellular phenotypes are from trafficking, activation, proliferation, or death, or, or other processes. Okay, so what does this look like in, in the colorectal cancer immune tumor microenvironment? Uh, you, we get a big map like this, which we can actually start to explore, and we can just read off, based on the changes in cellular phenotypes, what's going on in each, uh, uh, in each spatial context. So, for example, in JUST5, we see antigen-dependent T-cell mediated activation of B-cells. Uh, in, in, in the main tumor, we see antigen-dependent activation of immune cells. In the, uh, tumor, in, CN, in the spatial context involving both the tumor and tumor boundary. Because it seems like I'm having some color issues here. Uh, we see macrophage proliferation uh, in, in these SCs. Uh, and for example, we see suppressive interactions when all three of these things, all three of the T cell enriched, macrophage enriched, and uh, stroma enriched CNs are in, in contact. Um, and point to emphasize is that if you're an expert in tumor biology, then knowing these combinations and uh, uh, what's the phenotypic changes occurring within them, uh, that's mechanistic information to you in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, in previous understanding of this, of the tissue biology. Uh, what's really cool was when I came to the Broad to, to try this out uh, with spatial transcriptomic data. So here uh, we found the neighborhoods in uh, slide seek data set of the whole, embryo, whole mouse embryo. And uh, what we can do is we can find our spatial context as before. Um, and 
do some uh, gene ontology analysis to see which gene, uh, which, uh, gene modules are, and biological processes are enriched in, in different regions. And I don't know anything about uh, developmental biology, but what was cool is that you can start to see that just from, just from these completely automated techniques, we can see stuff like nervous system development in, uh, in CN9, which is just over here, uh, stem cell proliferation in, in the gray one, muscle structure development in, in the yellow one, and uh, get so ear morphogenesis uh, down here. Um, we see even more specific things like when the cyan and the blue are in contact, uh, there's EMT involved in endocardial cushion formation, uh, you know, where uh, or red and uh, yellow are in contact. We see hematopoietic stem cell, progenitor cell differentiation. And when you see, uh, when many different CNs are in contact, there's actually very small, precisely uh, defined uh, spatial context where you see things like histone dephosphorylation in, in future spinal cord cells. And so that's all just uh, from applying this, this map of the, what the different parts are how, and, and, and their joining, how they join to each other. Okay, so we want to build schematics of tissues. Um, and so what, what, what do we need? So we have these parts which are these neighborhoods and the, the regions with local processes ongoing. And we have how, they, how these parts join together. We have these spatial contexts with, with uh, these, uh, uh, in which we see these interactions. So what's missing, well, yes, it's how these parts are assembled into more complicated structures. So what do we need? We need, firstly, uh, computational tools uh, to infer the assembly of these structures. And then we also need a biological model to kind of ascribe to them some kind of meaning. Okay, so we started off with this, which was uh, we have our CNs and we have our spatial contexts uh, where in which stuff interacts. We added in the assumption, the additional assumption that in, within one of these neighborhoods, the, lo the local processes ongoing would propagate signals from one side to the other. From here, so if there's some white molecules here, they might diffuse, or there might be cell-to-cell -cell signaling, and so on. And so, why do we want to add this assumption? Because the because that means that when we have these uh, assembly of of these regions into into kind of uh, more complicated structures like this, uh, which we refer to as a motif, and I'll and I'll define in a moment, uh, we'd expect there to be some kind of uh, composition of these processes to generate uh, 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 outputs that individual elements can't. So, for example, if we saw uh, uh, if we saw some uh, this interaction at this spatial context generate some uh, white molecules, it might propagate the signal might propagate through this green neighborhood, and then which would eventually give rise to the interaction between the red cells. So, there's this uh, composite behavior that we might expect from from these motifs. So how are we going to uh, algorithmically identify these motifs and their assembly? So we start off with a tissue that's assembled into these motifs. So this is, this is our tissue, uh, have different neighborhoods. Uh, we segment them into connected components, and because this is this assumption that within each of these connected components, you have propagation of certain signals by, by the local processes. So here we have, uh, we have a blue region, a green region, five red and, and two, two black. Um, and then we can build a graph based on which spatial context form between them. So we have um, red is, uh, this, this red is next to blue and black. So uh, that's, that corresponds to, to this one. Uh, we have one blue, one, one green, um, and they're next to each other. So we have uh, one, an edge between them uh, and so on. Um, and we refer to a subgraph of this big graph of, uh, of the tissue uh, by, as an instance of a motif. So, and you might have multiple copies of the same motif in the same tissue. For example, in, in this graph, we have two copies of red and blue. Um, and of course, before I was talking about spatial context with uh, you know, multiple CNs, if we wanted to work with something like that, we'd have to uh, think about hypergraphs uh, or, or more complicated data structures. Okay, so that's the definition of motifs. How do we, uh, rep the, how do we represent them? 
Well, the assumption is that in a given tissue, these motifs don't exist, uh, at, don't just, aren't, aren't just arbitrarily uh, found, that there are actually rules that define how they relate to each other. Uh, and so how does this work? Well, we represent these rules by uh, motif, arrow motif, which, is, which says that an instance of a motif A uh, always extends to an instance of motif B. And so what does this mean? This means that blue is next to, when, whenever you see blue next to black, you also see blue next to black next to red. And we can check this in the original tissue by saying that whenever we see blue next to black, we see blue next to black, and it's also next to red. Um, and the point is that these rules uh, themselves have some kind of structure amongst them. So when we see these, when we see in, in this tissue, we, we have these two rules, which is that whenever we see blue next to black, we see blue next to black and black is next to red. Uh, we also have the same for green. These two rules are inferred from this simpler rule, which is that black is always next to uh, red. Uh, these other two rules down here, because they only involve two uh, CNs, two vertices, they, they can't be inferred from simpler rules. So we define this notion of a, of a basic rule um, as the ones that can't be inferred from simpler rules. And so then we have our tissue, this big graph is defined by uh, all of these rules, and all of these rules are generated from, by inference from these, from these basic rules. And when, when we did this analysis on our data sets, we literally just hashed uh, the motifs uh, and, and, and these rules, uh, but I think using more sophisticated uh, neural network-based approaches to, to actually describe these, these rules is a very interesting line of research. Okay, so uh, I'll show you these rules in, in action. So here we're going to talk about a bit about this uh, uh, human lymphoid tissue data set. Um, we have three types of tissue, uh, two tonsils, one lymph node and one spleen. Um, and we found these uh, neighborhoods and, and they were common to these tissues and we found some that were unique, uh, but I won't go into too many of the details about what they actually are. But, and we you know, identify these neighborhoods, built this big graph, uh, identify these motifs and these rules. And so uh, what I'm gonna show you now is how these simple rules, these basic rules actually uh, generate very complex inferences about the tissue. So, for example, when you start off with a, uh, the blue neighborhood, which is in, in these boxes, uh, a basic rule is that the blue is always next to brown. And that you can check that here, that's kind of highlighted here. You also have uh, another basic, ru a basic rule, which is that whenever you see uh, blue next to brown, uh, the brown is always next to cyan. Um, and so here, uh, we have to check that whenever we see blue next to brown, brown is next to cyan. We're, in order for this to be basic, uh, the cyan, uh, we need to see examples of brown which aren't next to cyan, and we, and we see that over here in these boxes. Um, whenever we see, uh, and then we have this other basic rule, which is that cyan is always next to green. Uh, and then we have another basic rule, which is that blue is always next to yellow. We have another basic rule that's whenever we see this, uh, this, uh, this uh, chain of brown, blue, yellow, we see that the brown, the brown is next to the yellow. Uh, and we see that uh, whenever these two, uh, whenever we have this, uh, whenever we have a cyan, it's never next to yellow, and that's indicated by this red edge. And so the point is that uh, when you, you have these simple basic rules, but actually they generate a very complex uh, in, inferential context for, for any kind of neighborhood. Whenever you see this uh, original neighborhood, um, uh, it's actually always part of this much larger, larger motif. Um, and what's the interpretation of this? It's that either we need the rest of the motif for, uh, before this, uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, this uh, neighborhood can form, or uh, there are some kind of constraints on the 3D architecture that we're, that we're picking up uh, with, with these rules. 
Um, and what we can do once we have these rules is that we can start to align tissues by the rules that, that govern them. So here we have just plotted uh, graphs of the basic rules uh, involving just one and two, uh, um, but, uh, one and two vertices. Uh, and then we can just take the intersection. So we have three, one for the spleen, lymph node, and tonsil. And we can take the intersection um, and find, and we found that there's uh, five uh, basic rules that are common to all three tissues. And we can investigate them. So uh, just as a quick example, well, something that's common is that cyan is next to brown. Um, and what we see is that in both, in kind of all of these tissues, whenever you see cyan, it's, it's next to brown. Um, and so that you can interpret these, this core uh, collection of rules that's common to all of these tissues as a kind of core assembly for human lymphoid tissue. Uh, and it, in addition to having this core assembly, you also have that uh, each individual tissue adds on its own rules, its own constraints. So for example, in the spleen, we see that brown is always next to dark blue, whereas in the uh, tonsil, we have that uh, cyan is next to dark green. Um, and of course, these all have interpretations in, in terms of lymphoid tissue biology, but I won't, uh, I won't, uh, I won't go too much into them. Okay, and uh, we can look at the kind of the more ba the more complex motifs and the basic rules in involving them. Um, so here's just uh, we just counted how many basic rules based on uh, the motif at the source and where the where the uh, additional edge was added, and we saw that the tonsil has by far the biggest number of basic rules, indicating that somehow its architecture is is the most complicated to specify. Uh, we can also look at how many uh, rules different different kinds of tissue tissues have in common, um, and uh, we saw that the tonsil and lymph node have 76 uh, uh, basic rules in common, whereas the others have um, other intersections are much uh, fewer, indicating that the architecture, uh, architect, the assembly of, of the tonsil and lymph node is much more similar than that of the other tissues, and so we can start to align these tissues in terms of their, uh, uh, in some kind of, in terms of kind of the phylogeny on their, on, the, on their rules. Okay, so takeaway is that using these basic, these rules, these assembly rules, we can, we can uh, and aligning tissues using them, we can view each different type of, t of, t of tissue as a variation on, the, on this uh, core lymphoid, lymphoid theme. Um, so, just to recap how this, uh, this, this idea of tissue schematics fil fits into this, uh, you know, works as a model for tissue semantics, well, we had the uh, three ingredients, which were, uh, which, were the, which were the parts and how they joined together to form uh, more composite parts, which we described with uh, neighborhoods, spatial context, and this analysis with motifs. Um, and then we also had these structures have a meaning, right, which, which, is, which we expressed in terms of this biological model, in terms of these uh, regions with characteristic local processes and signal propagation and, and so on. Okay, so we had uh, these two different models for tissue semantics. And uh, the starting point for this next approach is, you know, can we define models for tissue semantics that are suitable for tissue types whose organization isn't well described by, uh, by cellular neighborhoods. Uh, and we still want to be able to reason about them in the kind of automated way, so we still want to be able to align them. And so here we think about tissue types kind of more abstractly in the context of uh, a biological syntax. And I'll explain, explain that in a moment. So the structures that we've considered so far have been really, uh, you know, cell types, uh, neighborhoods, spatial context, motifs, and, and that's all been from codex data and uh, using these uh, schematics algorithms. Um, and so we want models for tissue semantics that are uh, kind of sufficiently general to ad address uh, other types of imaging data. So for example, subcellular data, 4D kind of over time data, maybe some functional data. Um, and we want to be able to look at other structures, for example, temporal structures, gene expression, uh, branching, vasculature, or maybe other kinds of structures that we haven't even learned yet and can be identified uh, with uh, un kind of unsupervised object detection strategies. And we want to be able to uh, 
incorporate all of this and still do the same analysis as we were doing before of looking at aligning tissues and, and understanding the rules that change uh, across, of, across them. And so I'm, going to, I'm just going to briefly talk about how the assembly rules and the inferential structure that we had uh, in tissue schematics uh, very naturally generalizes to uh, picturing the organization of a tissue as a, as a formal language. Um, and the cost of this is that the generality that we get by looking at other st structures, the cost of this is that we lose this interpretation that we had in terms of uh, signal propagation and, uh, and what was happening there. Okay, so how does this work? Well, what we saw before is that we had our uh, tissues, uh, we applied the schematics algorithms, and what we got is that we got these labeled sets. We got uh, the output of these algorithms was labeled sets. Uh, so uh, we had uh, instances of, of this motif of three, instances of this motif of two, uh, and we had those labeled sets in, in each uh, tissue. So we had A1, A1, B1, and C1 as these instances, and A2 in, in this, in the tonsil, and A2, B2, and C2 as these instances in, in the spleen. Uh, these these uh, sets that that were at the output of these algorithms weren't just existing in uh, weren't just floating in space. They weren't in isolation, but they were actually related because uh, we had every time the fact that this uh, motif was contained uh, this this graph is contained within this graph means that for every instance of this graph that this motif that we saw we also had an instance of of this this smaller motif. Uh, and so we had these labeled maps between these labeled sets uh, in, induced by these relationships between uh, these graphs. And, and finally, these labeled maps between labeled sets were arbitrary, but they actually respected these rules that we were seeing, these assembly rules. So for example, we saw things like every instance of X in this set A1 extend, extended to an instance Y of this motif in, in in B1, and if we saw that in both tissues, we would, uh, you know, come up with this rule, which is that uh, this this uh, arrow, this always. Then that was our that was our rule, and the f parameterizing our rules like this. Well, what did this let us do? It let us use this graphical calculus on these rules and uh, and how they relate to each other to understand different tissue types as variations on, on a common theme and to really align them and, and understand how they differ and how, they, how they're similar. Um, and this generalizes very naturally when, to, when all you have to do is to uh, replace these algorithms for identifying schematics to uh, arbitrary algorithms for passing images. So instead of so here we think about an, an algorithm for passing images that has output these sets of instances of different, different kinds, right, different types. Um, and we can apply these object detection algorithms to uh, uh, multiple images, um, and they'll generate these labeled sets of, of instances. Uh, and we don't need to specify what they are. And what does it mean for them to be passing the image? Well, they should also identify relations between these images, so we also want to have uh, maps between these labeled sets. So I like to think about this as some uh, general strategy for passing images that has an output, these instances of, uh, of each different kind of set, and relationships between them. And if you think about it, that's a very natural way to think about how one might pass images with, with, the, with the human eye. Um, and so instead of having these uh, labeled maps between labeled sets that respect assembly rules expressed in terms of uh, these motifs, we can, of course, just write them down in terms of uh, formal expressions in terms of these sets. So for all x in B1, there exists y in A1 with f1 of y equals x, and, and so on if we had that in, in the second case. And so our rule would be expressed as a symbolic expression uh, in, in terms of the relationships induced by what, ha by what happens when you uh, apply these passing algorithms. Um, and so then we can use this symbolic calculus on the rules instead of this graphical calculus on the motifs to understand uh, to different tissues as, as variations on, on a theme. So uh, I'll just collect things up uh, in this definition of uh, biological syntax. So we have a, um, and show how it, it, this forms a model for tissue semantics like I've been talking about. 
we start off with the uh, structures, which are these uh, type symbols uh, assigned to passing algorithms. So this, these are our object detection algorithms that we can apply to detect these uh, structures. Um, we have assembly because these uh, part the, uh, we have which assembly which consists of a bunch of functions. So the passing algorithm should identify related instances of structures, um, and we have meaning which is given by this collection of rules um, and the inferences that can be the logical inferences that can be drawn uh, from these rules. Okay, and so how would this work? How, how does this work, and why is this useful? Well, because it means that uh, you can image a biological in individual and you can think of having multiple uh, uh, different uh, possible modalities in which you image an individual to obtain, uh, and then you apply these algorithms that you specified in the syntax to get this representation in terms of sets and, and relations. Uh, and uh, the point is that if, when you get this uh, representation in terms of sets and maps, if there's, uh, if the, uh, uh, if it's consistent with these rules that have been specified, um, then we would say that the uh, 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 the individual that's imaged uh, is uh, a semantic model of the syntax, and that means that it really is exhibiting this organization that's encoded by the syntax. And you can imagine that, uh, although looking at different tissue kinds in different modalities. Uh, might give you a different uh, implementation of the passing algorithms, you would still expect there to be this underlying syntax which the organization is consistent with. And to just relate this back to the uh, analogy with, uh, uh, it, with, uh, with languages that I alluded to at the beginning, uh, you can imagine if you had something like this, uh, where you have a, a, a fox and, and, a, and a basset hound, uh, you think about passing this uh, visually to form instances of fox, dog, leg, tree, and so on, uh, if it's consistent with this sentence, which is the, the relationship specified by this sentence, which are, you know, the quick round fox jumps over the lazy dog, then you would say that this image is actually a model for this, uh, for this syntax. Okay, so that was the end of part three, and so we can extend tissue semantics beyond, uh, beyond neighborhoods by, uh, uh, viewing uh, the organization of a tissue as this formal language that's modeled by the individual example of the tissue uh, independently of the kind of modality that you're observing it. Okay, and so the question that motivates this, this final part of the talk is really, why do we want to consider these models for tissue semantics uh, versus other approaches that don't describe the assembly and, and composition into more complicated structures? Like, why, why, why do we need to do this? Um, and so for this, uh, I'll return to the um, colorectal cancer data set. And so we applied the alg algorithms that I was talking about before, the schematics algorithms, where we segmented instances of uh, neighborhoods and built tissue graphs, just as we had done uh, with, with human lymphoid tissue. And what we observed is that the, uh, the, the graphs of the DII patients, so the DII patients are the ones without follicles and the ones that survived, uh, did, had poor survival, uh, were much more fragmented than those of the CLR patients. So they had more vertices and more and a higher uh, degree, vertex degree on average than uh, um, the, CL, the CLR patients. And so that really raised, raised the question is uh, of if the CLR were this kind of uh, people carrier type assembly, were the DRI patients, was that just a jumbled mess since it's more fragmented? Or, or was it some kind of uh, racing car? Uh, really, is, is there, uh, in the DRI patients, is there order, is there disorder, or is there an alternate uh, tumor favoring order in the DRI patients? So how can we use these tools to, to get at this question? Um, well, the idea is if CLR, uh, so that, the question we want to answer is, is, can be pictured like this, if CLR is this, People carry is the eye, this racing car or, or a jumbled mess. Um, if it were, if the CLR patients' tissues were, if the DII patients' tissues were a, a jumbled mess, then how would we need to specify it? Well, we'd only need a simple schematic to specify it. All I would have to tell you is perhaps, you know, which individual parts you need and, and maybe kind of which uh, pairwise assembly, uh, pairs of parts you uh, need to put together. Uh, and that would be enough information to generate this, this jumbled mess, right? Uh, 
On the other hand, if you wanted to build a, a kind of more complicated racing car, there's no way that this much information, well, maybe if you're really good at this kind of thing, but there's no way that I'd be able to build this uh, kind of car um, with just a very simple schematic. I'd need more detailed instructions, uh, like how fit, which things fit together in, in precise way. Okay, so how, how can we uh, answer this uh, computationally? Well, the question becomes, do constraints on simpler motifs explain the emergence of more complex motifs in the tissue? And our goal is really then, as a result, to determine whether complex motifs arise more frequently than we would expect by entropy after we've specified, after we've constrained uh, the amounts of, of simpler motifs. Um, and so how does this work? We start off with a tissue graph, uh, and it's got its original coloring like this. Uh, we define null sets of color colorings by rearranging the observed graph. So what we can do is we can uh, swap the colors of vertices. So we have a bunch of different graphs with uh, different colorings. And if we allow ourselves to swap any pair of the colors of any pair of vertices, then we preserve the abundance of each edge uh, of each color. So I, we say how many of each piece there are, uh, but it, we've ignored uh, edges and, and more complicated uh, patterns. Um, so we have this uh, set of rearrangements, this null set. Um, and what does this look like? So this, if this is our space of colorings, we, have, we start off with, an, with our original coloring, and we have these different uh, rearrangements. Now the schematic, this simple schematic being sufficient, means that all rearrangements should look like the original tissue. So all of these uh, that we've uh, obtained by rearranging the tissue in this way should look like the original tissue. Um, and what does that mean? It means that uh, when, you, when you look at the counts of, for example, a more complicated structure like this, this colored edge, then you'd expect to see that uh, if the schematic was sufficient, you know, changing it, all of it would uh, not change dramatically the counts of this edge, whereas if the schematic were insufficient, uh, for all of these colorings, you'd see, you'd see a big change in, in, in the counts of this edge. Um, and so we can actually statistically uh, quantify this. We can uh, just actually directly sample our, our graphs using, you know, random permutations, uh, and then do hypothesis testing to see if um, uh, the, this uh, given uh, an edge arises more frequently than uh, you'd expect by random. Um, and so what we, th we saw is that the, both the CLR patients and the DIA patients had a similar number of these edges that arose uh, more frequently than you'd expect by entropy if you'd uh, constrained uh, the number of uh, vertices. And, and we refer to these as kind of higher order edges. Okay, so maybe, so it, that indicates that, you know, it's not sufficient to, uh, to specify the, um, the, just the number of parts. Maybe uh, these, these uh, uh, different uh, patient groups differ once you specify both the uh, number of parts and the number of pairwise interactions. So here we just uh, extend this approach by allowing ourselves to swap pairs of colors, not just arbitrarily, but when they have the exact same uh, neighboring vertices. And so you see that if you allow these kinds of swaps, uh, you'll uh, preserve both the abundance of each color uh, as well as we did before, but we'll also preserve the uh, uh, abundance of each colored edge, uh, but we'll be ignoring more complicated uh, patterns. Um, it turns out you can't sample directly once you want to uh, uh, once you want to impose this constraint, so you have to use an MCMC technique. Um, and while this was quite relatively easy to implement for uh, this kind of uh, constraint, uh, it would be really interesting to think about how we can extend this to more complicated null sets. But when, once you have this distribution that you've generated by MCMC, uh, you can just do some hypothesis testing, whereas instead of testing just the count of the edge, you test, well now we're gonna test the count of each triangle. So our finding was that uh, in both CLR and DII patients, they had a similar number of triangles uh, that were significant after we'd constrained uh, the number of, of, of edges. And 
that, that, was, that was very interesting because it means that if the, the CLR patients were something like this, then the DII patients were a different kind of assembly of something structured and not, not just a jumbled mess. But what was more interesting was that the, uh, this one motif that we found, uh, which was a T cell enriched, macrophage enriched, and, and vasculature uh, triangle, it was observed in all patients but it was only a higher order, it was only significant in, uh, after we'd constrained the number of edges in this one patient group. And so we decided to look into this a bit more, uh, and this is uh, why I talk about the genetics analogy, because we took this, uh, we took this uh, motif, which was, uh, we had uh, one, four, seven, just, uh, T cell enriched, macrophage enriched, and, and, uh, and vasculature, um, and we looked at mutations to it, uh, corresponding to inserting different motifs. So, for example, you might uh, mutate it by adding uh, a green over here or a brown over here and, and so on. And we looked at, you know, are any of these mutated motifs enriched in, in one patient group relative to the other? And we found, uh, and we found that the follicle was, uh, which is the TLS that, uh, you know, characterizes the uh, one patient group was preferentially enriched in that patient group um, at all of these positions. So it's it added all to the purple, blue, and gray. But we also found that the, uh, what was more interesting is that in the DIA patients, so these are the patients that don't survive, have worse survival outcomes, uh, the tumor was uh, inserted preferentially at this one position next to the uh, T cell enriched uh, neighborhood. Um, and this was in almost half of the DIA patients. So eight of the 17 patients had this, had this motif. So we assessed whether this was associated survival, and it turns out that the DIA patients that have this motif um, have considerably worse survival outcomes, significantly worse survival outcomes than the DIA patients that, that don't have this motif. Um, and this is kind of different. Uh, this effect is orthogonal to uh, what I was talking about before with the granular site in rich neighborhood. So having this uh, mutated motif uh, is uh, associated with worse survival outcomes. Okay, um, and what we, what we did next was we looked at the submotifs of this motif and to see if they also had similar associations with survival. So here is a, is a plot of the, uh, the submotifs of this, of this motif. Um, the edges indicate uh, you know, the containment of submotifs so for example, we obtain this one by removal of this edge, and so on. Uh, and uh, the, the circle, the intensity of the circle around it indicates the, where the presence of an association with survival. Um, and so the point is that when we look at these submotifs with uh, just three of the four uh, uh, neighborhoods, there's no significant association with survival. Uh, that means that you have to look at all four of them together uh, to see an association with survival. Okay, and so the frequency of complex tissue motifs isn't explained by constraints on simpler motifs, and these complex tissue motifs have associations with survival um, that are emergent, that aren't explained by each of the individual components. And that's, an, and that's why we need to look at this assembly of, of motifs into more complicated structures, uh, uh, and that's why we need to look at these models for tissue semantics. Okay, so I'll uh, quickly summarize by representing high-parameter tissue uh, imaging data with respect to different models for tissue semantics, so having these different notions of structure, uh, assembly, and their collective meanings, we gain some understanding of these different tissue types so in, in human lymphoid tissue, we found a, a core assembly that was specialized and, uh, to each different tissue type. And in, in colorectal cancer, we found uh, you know, in, in the neighborhoods analogy that the functional states of neighborhoods were associated with survival. We found changes in how, how neighborhoods communicated. And we also found this thing about how this uh, higher order motif, uh, its mutations were associated with survival and that these associations were emergent. So I'll quickly just uh, do my acknowledgments, um, and I'm happy to take questions. So uh, a lot of this work was done during my PhD in uh, Gary Nolan's laboratory, uh, and in particular in collaboration with Graham uh, Barlow. Uh, 
um, who's another grad student in the lab. Um, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, coll my collaborators at the Broad Institute, Vey and Louis, as well as my mentors, Juan and Caroline, um, and of course, funding sources. So with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions now.